I love the book of John, especially this chapter. It's a great chapter. I want to focus in here now, and bear with me. This is too much to pass up, and it's actually related to what to what I'm going to be preaching on this morning. But not very, not not. It wasn't in my notes to start with, but this story about Thomas, right? He's called doubting Thomas. We're going to read here just real briefly. Look at look back at verse number 27 when Jesus is speaking to Thomas. He says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now why was he saying that, you know, be not faithless, but believing? Because Thomas wasn't with the group earlier when Jesus had appeared unto them, and was doubting whether or not Jesus actually came back from the dead. Now, this is a proof that he's giving to Thomas of look at the holes in my hands. Look at my side where they appear. Here, give me your hand, thrust it into my side. You know, he's like, look, you could feel me, you could handle me, you could see that it's really, literally me. Jesus Christ literally, bodily came back from the grave. He didn't come back in some other body. He came back in his own body, which is why he's proving it to him here. Look, look at the holes in my hands. And he says in his hands, plural, it holds in his hands and his feet and, they, and, and, his, and his side. And it says also, by the way, um, no, it's not, I, yeah, it's not right here, that it's the nails, plural. He had nails going through his hands. So there's more than one. 25? Yeah, it's, it was, we didn't, I didn't just read that this morning, but it was, I knew it was in this passage. Verse 25, it says, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto him, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. Nails, plural. But um, what he does here, he says, Look, you need to believe. And what is it they need to believe? Look at verse 28. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He said unto Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, and this is another proof of that. One of the reasons I love this so much. Now, if Jesus Christ was a good teacher, if he was the Son of God, but he was not God, would he not have had to say to Thomas, Thomas, okay, you know, thanks for honoring me, but I'm not God. Don't call me God. We see in the Bible other examples of men who have bowed down and fallen down and started worshiping like angels that have, that have come to them. And they said, stand up on your feet like Emmanuel. I mean, Apostle Paul did that. Stand up on your feet. I'm a man like you. I'm not God. God deserves worship. Ten Commandments. We're not supposed to worship any other God, fall down, make any other image, you know. Jesus Christ received praise and worship and he was called God. And what did he say? He didn't say, Thomas, wait, I'm not God. He said, verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Believed what? My Lord and my God. Believed what? That he bodily rose from the dead. Hey, this is, this is a great testimony, a great story. Now, this is what a person has to do to be saved. They have to put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to believe that he was God in the flesh, believe that he died on the cross, rose again, and paid for their sins. Now, when a person does that, and this is how it ties into to my sermon, when a person believes this, because salvation is so clearly written, even right here in this verse, and then even it continues on to say, you know, these things are written, verse 31, the last verse of the chapter, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The whole book of John is just so geared around people believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving salvation and being saved. But once a person believes, now in the New Testament where we're at today, when a person puts their faith in Christ, they're born again, okay? Now, that has always been the case. And I, I taught this last week in John chapter 3. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And he tells him that, you know, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus didn't understand that. And he's like, what are you talking about born again? You know, and he saw, he's thinking physically, like I can't go back in my mother's womb, be born again. What are you talking about? He says, Jesus answered him. And he says, you know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He, just, he says, well, look, it's a spiritual birth. But then he goes on and he says, are you a master in Israel and you don't know these things? He was rebuking him for not understanding what it means to be born again. So the being born again, your spirit being born again, 
is not a new concept. It's not specific to the New Testament. Old Testament, New Testament believers alike. I mean, Adam, in the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit, in that day he surely died. Now, he didn't die physically. What died? His spirit died in that day, the moment we sinned. And all of us, you know, what the Apostle Paul wrote, I was alive without the law once. You know, we all born, we have our spirit is alive. But when sin revived, you know, when, when, um, when we sin, then our spirit dies. When, when we sin, having the understanding, having the knowledge of the law, all of a sudden it kills our spirit and we die. And that's why we need to be born again. We get born again by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. But something that's new in the New Testament is the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we receive as believers. And this is what we see here. Um, real quick, keep your finger in John chapter 20. Flip back to John chapter 7. Because Jesus talks about it a little bit before they actually receive the Holy Ghost. John chapter 7, verse 37. The Bible reads in John 7, 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then it explains what he's talking about there in parentheses. It's, you know, because Jesus is just preaching this. And at the time, there were probably a lot of people that were saying, oh, what are you talking about? You know? But it says here in verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. He says that's something that didn't happen yet, because Jesus Christ still needed to die on the cross. He still needed to rise again from the dead and be glorified. Once that happened, then it was possible for them to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Turn, if you would, to John, back to John chapter 20. This is the moment where we see them now, because in John chapter 20, he's already risen from the dead. He's already been glorified. And, you know, that has all come to pass. Look at verse number 21. The Bible reads, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. His act of breathing on them was giving them the indwelling of the Holy Ghost to reside within them at that moment. And it's real interesting because that, that breath Giving the, the Holy Ghost reminded me a lot of in Genesis when God formed man out of the ground. Now, it wasn't the Holy Ghost he was giving, but in Genesis 2.7, the Bible reads, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So in the creation, when God created man, he breathed man's soul into him. Now here in the New Testament, after Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he breathed into man and gave him the Holy Ghost. This is something that was new. It was something that had never before been done. He, you know, and you could read up on this. I'm not going to preach this morning on the indwelling of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, as, as they're, they're commonly called. It's you know, um, back and forth. The, the words are interchangeable. But what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is being filled with the Spirit. Not the indwelling of, but, but what the Bible refers to as having the Holy Ghost upon you or having the Holy Spirit on you and or being in the power of the Holy Spirit. Something that's, that's slightly different that has also always been around throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. So I wanted to make the distinction as we get started that there is this new thing that's the indwelling, where the Holy Spirit literally resides. So, you know, your body is the temple. Of the, of the Holy Ghost and, and um, a lot of the scripture it talks about the comforter being there to be with you because Jesus had left and he's like well I'm not going to leave you comfortless and he leaves us with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit with the laws written on our hearts with, with God's Holy Ghost um, being there with us but having the power and this is where a lot of people get confused is one of the reasons why I want to bring this up and make this differentiation because a lot of the verses I'm going to be looking at this morning is going to be having God, the power of God's Holy Spirit resting on you and empowering you to do things 
which is different than the Holy Ghost that actually resides inside of you once you're, once you're um, saved. Because that, that Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit of promise that God seals you with. Ephesians 1, on the, on the front of our, um, of our handouts, has the verse saying that, that we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. After that, we heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And uh, God seals us with that. But what we're going to be looking at more tonight, turn if you would to Acts chapter 1. And this will help to explain a little bit because Acts chapter 1, we just read in John chapter 20 where Jesus breathed on him. He said, and to his disciples, it said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, right? Those same people now are here at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is taking place after John 20. John 20, Thomas hadn't even seen Jesus yet, and he sees him there, you know, and he proves him, okay, look, I'm here. Acts chapter 1, look at verse number 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So now he's bringing reference to being baptized with the Holy Ghost. And baptism is literally just immersion. You're going to be immersed. That's why, you know, as Baptists, we believe in, in full immersion baptism because when you go back to what the, what the meaning of that word is, it's a transliteration from the Greek. Bautizo, is, it, it literally means just to be immersed. So when we baptize people, you go fully under the water because you're fully immersed and surrounded by water. We don't do pouring or sprinkling or anything like that. That's not a true baptism. Just by the definition of the word. Baptism is immersion. So here we see a reference to being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Meaning you're going to be immersed. I mean, you're going to be surrounded by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, they have been, received the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, but as evidenced here... They haven't been baptized with the Holy Ghost for what, they were, what it was referring to. So those are two different things. It's not the exact same thing. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, after the, no, you say, well, wait a minute, didn't Jesus breathe the Holy Ghost in them? Yes, but that was the indwelling. This is the different concept than the Holy Ghost coming upon a person. So keep a bookmark and act. We're coming back to it because we're going to see more of the fulfillment of what we're just reading here in Acts chapter 1 in Acts chapter 2. And for those of you familiar with the Bible, Acts chapter 2, of course, is talking about the day of Pentecost, where, where they were speaking with other tongues. There were men from all different countries around, and they were able to communicate in all of their different languages through the power of the Holy Spirit. Languages that they didn't know, God was able to miraculously allow them to communicate with other people in their own foreign language. That's what ended up happening here. But turn, if you would, keep a, keep a bookmarker in Acts. We're going coming back to it. Turn, if you would, to Exodus 31. Because I want to show you some examples from the Old Testament where God's Holy Spirit came upon people just like it did to them in the book of Acts. To prove to you that this is, this is not a new concept from the Old Testament. The indwelling was. It was something that was not yet given. But the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon people has happened all throughout Scripture. Exodus chapter 31. When God was explaining to Moses and telling him and commanding him, this is how you're going to build the tabernacle, this is what it's going to look like, and giving him all the details on that, he also told him who was going to be in charge of working on some of the stuff and, and being the, the, the people who were going to create the, the, the ornate uh, tools and service, you know, all the different things that are going to be done here. Look at verse number 1 of Exodus 31. The Bible reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass 
and in cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. This is a spiritual gift that God has given unto this man to perform this great task because God wants his tabernacle to look a certain way. He wants everything to be done the way he wants it to. So in order to do this, is I'm giving this guy all this skill and all this talent. I'm pouring out my spirit on him to do these things the way I want him to have done. I'm giving him wisdom. I'm giving him understanding. He's going to know exactly what it is that I want to have done. God gave him that ability and says he filled him with the spirit of God. Now, this man wasn't just indwelled with the Holy Ghost for all time. This is something that God gave him, this spiritual gift, in order to do these tasks. Look at chapter 28, just a, a few chapters earlier from 31. Chapter 28, verse 3. We'll see something similar. Exodus 28, 3 says, And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So here's again another example. This is the people who were actually making the garments for the priests to wear. And he says, I've given them the spirit of wisdom so that they could understand these things. 2 Kings chapter 2. If you want to turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to see the story of Elisha. Remember Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was the predecessor to Elisha. Elisha was there and, and became his servant and was, was always with them up until the point where Elijah was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah was the man that, that called fire down from heaven. He's the one that was, that was mocking the, you know, the, the worshipers of Baal and saying, you know, oh, where's your God? Is he sleeping? Maybe you've got to wake him up, you know? And, and perform that great miracle of, of his sacrifice then being the one that was taken. I, I love Elijah. He's a great character in the Bible. But we see here, Elisha was, was ministering unto him. He was, he was learning from him. He was kind of his understudy. And it came a point where Elijah knew it was time for him to go. And he keeps going from, from place to place. And he's saying, all right, Elisha, you don't have to follow me anymore. You know, Elisha's like, no, I'm going to be here with you all the way to the end. I'm sticking with you. And we get to the point in the story here in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9, where Elijah's like, okay, well, fine, what, you know, what do you want? Because he's been faithful the whole time. Even though he knows he's going to be taken away, he's like, what do you want? And we're going to see what he asked for here in verse number 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. So here we see another example of the spirit resting on Elisha and giving him that power. Now, prior to this event happening, Elisha didn't have the power to part the waters up. Elijah did. Elijah was going with Elisha. And prior to this, we see, if you want to read earlier in the story, Elijah parted the water and they, and they crossed when they were going there. When Elisha saw him get taken up, and, and ask for that double portion of the Spirit. He said, the Spirit that you have, I want twice as much. And what a great view as a Christian. I mean, amen? Like, like just having that view of just, man, what a great man of God Elijah was. And you look at all the things that he had done and all the ways that God used him and all the miraculous things that happened. And he's like, I don't want to just be like you. I want double what you did. Double what you have. We ought to have that type of a zeal. Say, man, you know, here's a great example I want God to use me even more. Give me a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah's even like, that's, that's a hard thing you've asked. But, I mean, he didn't condemn him for it. He's like, okay. Right? And, and if, 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 what a great attitude, too, for, for a great man. God, he's like, you know, instead of being, ha, 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 I did all these things. You think you could do twice? He's like, 
okay, great. Hey, it, you know, if, God, if it's God's will, if this happens, then, then you'll get it. Praise God for that. But we see it's, you know, God had given Elijah that power through his spirit. And he gave that same power unto Elisha. Now, not everyone had that power, but God had given them that power with his spirit that he laid upon them to give them that power. I don't have it in my notes, but we saw the same thing with, um, with the King Saul. King Saul had the power of God on him, but then God removed his spirit from him and he put it on David. When Saul screwed up, when Saul wasn't doing the things that God told him to do, when he became rebellious and disobedient and saw the witch and did, you know, and did all these various sins and these different things, God's like, okay, well, I'm going to remove my power from you. And that's the same way today. You know, if any of the disciples would have just fallen out and just not, you know, started sinning and started doing things they shouldn't have been doing, that power that they had to cast out devils, the power that they had to do all these different healings and all these other things, they wouldn't have had that anymore. God would have removed that from them, but they wouldn't have lost their salvation. The, the indwelling was always there. It's something that you're sealed with. But we're, we're looking at the, at the power of God upon us. So let's um, turn, if you would, to Judges 13. We're going to see another example of a man that, uh, that God rested his power upon, his spirit upon. And I just want to show you all these, you know, many various examples here from the Old Testament to show you this is not some new thing. And it's not something that can't happen today either. This has happened in the Old Testament, it's happened in the New Testament, and it's available today. Uh, I'm going to read for you from Numbers 11. Numbers 11, 16, <clears throat> we're going to see where God took some of the spirit that he had in Moses. Moses is another man. I mean, think about all the miracles and all the things, all the plagues that were done in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, they were going through the wilderness, they ate the manna, you know, Moses had to, you know, he smote the rock, and the, and the water gushed out from the rock. All of these various things that Moses was used through the power of God to do. It says in Numbers eleven sixteen, 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee, and I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And this is when, of course, you know, Moses was kind of getting burnt out. I mean, he's one man, and he's got... All of the children of Israel trying to deal with all their problems. I can't take this anymore, God. Like, I just can't do it. I'm not doing a good job. Like, just take my life. Kill me now, God. I can't do this. So God said, okay, I'm going to give you 70 other men, you know, to, to help you with this, to help do the judging and, to, you know, to help with these matters. And he took some of the spirit that Moses had on him and distributed it among 70 other people that also then had this power of the Spirit of God upon them to help give them wisdom and understanding so that they would make the right choices and understand the law better when, uh, when dealing with all those people. So again, it's, it, this, we're going to see this over and over and over again. Judges 13, we're going to see the story of Samson. Everyone here probably knew the story of Samson. If you grew up in any type of Christian home, Samson is a guy that had all the strength, right? I mean, he's able to, to take the, the, the gates from the, of the city and just, just carry them out and, you know, and did all these great things. He killed all these people with, you know, with the story of the jawbone of an ass, and he smote you know, all the Philistines and just was able to defeat them all with his mighty strength. But that mighty strength came from God. Look at Judges 13, verse 24. Judges 13, 24. Bob reads, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So right from early on in his life, the Spirit of God was coming upon Samson and began to move him and, dir and direct him and guide him. Chapter 14, turn if you would to chapter 14, verse 19. Judges 14, 19. The Bible reads, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, <clears throat> And he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. So here we see the Spirit of God coming upon him before he has that great might to do the things that he did. And 
the strength that Samson had, it wasn't because he was some weightlifter. It wasn't because he was a bodybuilder and he just amassed all the strength himself. He had supernatural power. He had the Spirit of God and the power of God upon him. That is why he ever had the strength to begin with. Look at Judges 15. Verse number 14, Judges 15, verse 14. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand, excuse me, a thousand men therewith. He was able just, just under that strength, the strength of the Holy Ghost being upon him. I mean, I think a thousand people. Anyone who's ever been in a fight with one person, whether it be wrestling, a fist fight, whatever, that takes a lot of energy out of you in a very short period of time. You do a you wrestle, wrestle for 30 seconds. And I mean really wrestle with someone. That, that drains you. That's one person. I mean, multiply that by a thousand. I mean, how long would it even take to kill a thousand people with the jawbone of an ass? I mean, he just, you know, and I mean, at the end of it, he was super exhausted. He's just, he's like ready to die. But uh, that's incredible. And that's incredible power. And that just kind of goes to show some of the power of the Holy Ghost. Now we see that, and, and you know what? There's a lot of other examples. I'll read for you from 1 Samuel chapter 10. When it talks about Saul, verse 6 says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And we're going to start looking at the effect of the Holy Ghost upon you, and the power that comes with that. And God said here unto Saul, He says, You know what? You're going to go, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to be turned into another man. That's what the, the power of the Holy Ghost is a power to change people, it is a power to, to change your life. And, um, he said unto Saul, you know, you're going to prophesy, you're going to preach. And that's going to be the common theme here this morning. I'm just going to give it away. We're going to see this over and over again. When you have the power of the Holy Spirit upon you, what they did, by and large, they went out and they preached. They went out and they, and they preached God's word. And that's exactly what happened here with Saul. Uh, 1 Samuel 11, 6 says in this spirit. Turn back, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. We'll go back to Acts. 1 Samuel 11, 6 says, And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those, thing, those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. He had a great zeal, that anger. You know, a lot of people will say, Oh, you can't ever be angry. Being angry is sin. No, being angry isn't a sin. Having unrighteous anger is a sin. Being angry with your brother without a cause is a sin. But here we see Saul, the Spirit of God came on him, and he was angry. Like, like, when, like after God's Spirit came upon him, he became angry, and, and, and rightfully so. Because, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into that whole story of uh, that read-up if you want in uh, 1 Samuel 11, if you want to know the whole background of that. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, though, because we're going to see now a lot of New Testament references here, especially in the book of Acts, of God's Holy Spirit coming upon people and the power and the boldness that that gives. We need more people today with God's Spirit upon them. Acts chapter 2. I mean, we definitely need more people with the Holy Spirit indwelling them, right? Getting them saved. But not just getting saved. Getting saved isn't enough when it comes to the Holy Ghost coming upon people. We need people because the great works of God are done through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way it's going to be done. And we need God's power to get anything done for Him. We need Him with us. We need Him working with us. And um, look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to see a great example of this. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So just to be clear on this, you could read through Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see it, look at a few more verses, 
There's a, a false movement out there of Pentecostalism, where you know Pentecostal comes from the word Pentecost, and in Acts chapter two, this is the day of Pentecost, and these people that believe that you know what they what happened here when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you start speaking with they call it speaking with tongues, and you start going, oh, blah, 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 you know, just going, you know, like, and people are just like, what are you talking about? You know, like, no one understands what they're saying. That's a fraud. That's false. That's not what speaking in tongues is. When they spake with other tongues, you could see in Acts chapter 2, they were speaking to people in their own language. It would be if, I mean, I don't know, um, who here speaks another language other than English? You do, right? You speak Polish. So if I were to stand up here, I don't know Polish. I don't know like one word in Polish unless you use the word no, but uh, you know... <laughs> Something like that. Okay, I don't know a word. But if I were to stand up here today and not knowing it was just to start preaching and what you heard was Polish coming out of my mouth, that's what happened here in Acts chapter 2. And it is clear from the context. You cannot interpret this any other way. It lists off all the places where the people were from. Now, Brother Sebastian would be able to understand me. He'd be like, wow, that's my native tongue. I know, I know Polish. He'd be able to, to hear what I was saying unto him and that would be through the power of the Holy Spirit because I don't know that language. That's what the disciples did. And that's what happened when the Holy Ghost came upon them. And we're going to jump down here to, well, you know what, let's just read a little bit more because I want to prove this to you. I don't want to just say it. We were in verse 4. Look at verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded they were confused. The multitude came together. They, they heard what was going on. They were confused. It says, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So God poured out the Holy Spirit. They were speaking with another tongue. And really, tongue is just another word for language. That's all it is. We don't really use that terminology today too much. You speak commonly, the word is just language. But a tongue is just a language. Which makes sense. I mean, you speak with your tongue. So you're speaking with another tongue, another language. But that's exactly what the Bible defines it as. It says, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? I mean, they're all from Galilee. And think about it. They were fishermen. They were you know, blue-collar workers. They weren't these educated Pharisees that had like all these different degrees and studied all these different languages. They're like, these guys are just Galileans. So, Aren't, isn't that where they're all from? They're not from these other areas. And verse 8 says, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So how, how is this even possible? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost came upon him. And that, I mean, th to, to take this any other way is absolutely ridiculous. And it, it's so evidently a fraud to say that, you know, making a circus out of church and people rolling around in the aisles and just, just spouting off nonsense that they want to call another language that nobody understands is of the Spirit of God is ridiculous. The reason why the Holy Spirit even worked here is because there were people gathered from all over the place. And Jesus Christ had just risen from the dead. And all this had just happened. And the gospel needed to be preached and reached unto the ends of the earth. And what better way than for all the people who were just visiting in Jerusalem at that time to hear the word of God preached, to be able to bring that home in their own tongues, in their own languages, and spread that everywhere. That was the purpose. And that's evidently what the, what the Bible is teaching here. But let's jump down here now to verse number 16. Because, you know, there's this whole rug. I mean, if people are confused, what's going on? Some people are saying, these guys are just drunk, you know, what, because they couldn't understand what they were saying. And Peter explains what's going on here. He says in verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And the prophesying is the preaching that they were doing. It's them speaking the word of God. The source was the outpouring of the Spirit. The result 
was them going out and preaching the Word of God. Preaching the Word of God to people they don't know. Preaching the Word of God to anybody that would listen to them. They received the power from the Holy Spirit to go out and do that. Regardless of the language that they were speaking. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 4. We're going to see some commonalities all throughout the book of Acts of people being filled with the Holy Ghost or with the Holy Spirit and what they actually do. Acts chapter 4, verse number 8. Acts 4, 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So what did Peter do when he was filled with the Holy Ghost? He spake. He said. And in this instance, he was speaking to rulers. He was speaking to people who had power, people who didn't like. I mean, these are some of the same people that, that crucified Jesus Christ. People who you might be scared to say anything in front of about your beliefs when they just killed your leader. I mean, think about that. But through the, whole, the power of the Holy Ghost, Peter laid it all out. He wasn't afraid for a second. He, he was bold and was able to preach unto them and not hold anything back. That was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number 31, Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at this. And they spake the word of God with boldness. We see in a trend here. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Acts chapter 7 is, is, this, is the chapter where Stephen is martyred. Stephen preaches a sermon. He's talking unto the Pharisees. He's preaching Jesus Christ. He gets to the point and, uh, you know, where um, he was talking about the Gentiles and, he, and, and they just couldn't handle that anymore. They stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it. And they stoned Peter to death. But look at uh, verse number 55 here in Acts 7. It says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said... So again, and said, right? He's full of the Holy Ghost. He looks up in heaven. He sees Jesus. He sees God. He says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He said. And then look at what it says in verse um, 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. But look at verse 59. And I just want to bring this up because it's another evidence of Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. It says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Who is he calling upon? God. And saying, what did he say when he called upon God? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's the narrator of the Bible saying that. That's the, the Holy Ghost inspired scripture that says Stephen was calling on God when he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Another awesome evidence in Scripture that shows you, hey, Jesus Christ is God. But he did that and he said that through the Holy Ghost, through the power of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. Turn if you go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Verse number 44, Acts 10. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed, for the, and then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So Jesus goes and, he's, and he preaches unto these Gentiles, he preaches unto these Italians, and he says, you know, he was led there of the Holy Ghost. He's preaching unto them. The Holy Ghost falls on the people that were listening to Peter preach. At that moment. And how did they know? How did Peter know the Holy Ghost fell upon them? Because they started speaking. They started speaking with other tongues. They started speaking with languages they didn't know. But they started to speak. The Holy Ghost comes upon them and they start to speak. We see something familiar happening here. Now, I also want to point, since we're in this passage, you know, a lot of false people will falsely teach that 
oh, you know, the, the, the being baptized with the Holy Spirit happens when you're literally baptized in water and all this other nonsense and you can't get, you know, the, the Holy Ghost unless you're baptized in water and they make this big emphasis on baptism of water. But what happened here in the Bible? What happened here was they received the Holy Ghost and then they got baptized after that. And you know what's really interesting is that the point where Peter got to in his preaching, look at verse number 43. It's one verse right before we started reading here. We started reading in verse 44 where, where the Holy Ghost falls upon them. Verse 43, it says, Peter was preaching this to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. They heard the gospel. And prior, if you go back prior to that in context, he talks about Jesus Christ dying and being crucified and rising again from the dead. And then he gets to the point where he says, hey, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. What happened in that moment? They put their faith on Jesus Christ in that moment while Jesus Christ was preaching unto them. I believe they called on the name of the Lord in their heart and they believed on Jesus Christ right there at that moment which is why the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Ghost came on them and they received the power of the Holy Ghost then to speak with other tongues. And because they believed, because they even saw the evidence of it through the Holy Ghost being upon them, that's when they commanded them to be baptized. The baptism happened after. It had nothing to do with them receiving the Holy Ghost at all. The baptism is symbolic, but I'm not going to preach a whole sermon on baptism. It's a whole other sermon in and of itself. Turn if you go to Acts chapter 13. Because we're seeing the result of people being filled with the Holy Spirit, with, with God's Holy Spirit being upon them. What are they doing? Time after time after time after time after time, they're speaking. They're preaching. And they're speaking boldly. They're not just speaking quietly. They're not just going and talking to their friend. They're speaking publicly. They're speaking out. Look at Acts chapter 13. We're going to see here some more boldness to confront the wicked. With Elemis the sorcerer, Acts chapter 13, verse number 8, the Bible reads, But Elemis the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them. So now they're facing opposition, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He calls him out and says, you devil, you get it, you know, because he, he's trying to prevent this other guy from hearing the word of God and getting saved. And Paul, you know, Paul says, get out of here, you devil, and confronts him and has the boldness to speak up and to stand up. See, unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of Christians today, they don't have the spirit of God upon them because when the wicked come up and say their wickedness and, and pervert God's word and blaspheme the name of God, what do Christians do? They cower down in fear. They don't say anything. They're afraid to raise up their voice and say, you're a child of the devil, you're wicked as hell, this is what the Bible says, and you're preventing people from getting saved and standing up and saying something about it. But someone who's got the Holy Ghost of God will say something. You're going to have the boldness to do so. Obviously, this is something that we want to have in our lives. We want to have God's power resting upon us. We want God's Holy Spirit being upon us. So I'm going to look at a couple different ways of how to become filled with the Spirit. One way is to pray. The Bible says, you know, just to pray for me that God would give me utterance of speech. This is the Apostle Paul speaking from prison when he's writing his, his, his epistles saying, look, you know, he was thrown in prison for preaching the gospel of Christ. And he's like, pray for me that God will give me more boldness. Right? We need to have that boast. We need to go to God in prayer. But the, we see also that the Holy Spirit and the power of God comes from the laying on of hands. Turn back, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Reads, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So these people were saved, they'd been baptized, but they still hadn't received the power of the Holy Ghost. So they prayed for them, and then they laid hands on them, and then they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18 says, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. 
So this guy is looking at this and he's saying, oh, hey, I want that power too to be able to put my hands on people and then they get the power of God. And he tried to buy it with money. He's like, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works, right? This is the gift of God. You can't buy God's gift with money. But um, we see here, through the laying on of hands, they received that power. Acts 19, verse 6 says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. There is an emphasis here on, on the laying on of hands. Now, we believe when, you know, <clears throat> when, when pastors are sent out, when they start other churches, that there is a laying on of hands, you know, laying on of the hands of the presbytery, which it says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, the exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Remember in Acts 8, he says, You thought to buy the gift of God with money? It's a gift that's given. He says, Look, you've been given this gift, Timothy. Don't neglect it. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. That gift was given when those hands were laid upon him. And he was sent out and, and became a pastor of another church. And this is why we believe that, you know, there's people today that think, oh man, why, why do you need to be sent out? Why do you need to be given? You know why? Because people, you know, men of God lay hands on you and that's when the power of God is going to come upon you and you're going to go out boldly and do great things for the Lord. I know for a fact that this was true when that happened to me prior to being sent out, prior to having the, the presbytery lay hands on me of my church and my man of God sending, you know, sending me out and ordaining and, and, and sending out my preaching prior to that had changed dramatically after that. The, you know, I experienced different, you know, just, just a gift of God in being able to teach and to reach people after that happened. It's a gift that's given from God by the laying on of the hands. And that's taught throughout Scripture. And again, I could, I could make an entire sermon out of that one subject itself, but we're kind of looking at receiving the power of the Holy Ghost upon you um, in general. And, and just one, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. It's the last place you're going to turn this morning. We're almost done. Ephesians chapter 5. But it was the same way in the Old Testament. Again, I don't want to forget about that. The laying out of the hands happened in the Old Testament also. Now the church was a little bit different. The establishment was different with the, with the uh, tabernacle and then with the temple. But the, but the receiving God's power by the laying on of hands, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, I'll read this for you. Deuteronomy 34, 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. When it was Joshua's turn to take up the torch and to continue leading the children of Israel when Moses was departing, Moses laid hands on Joshua. And he received the Spirit of God. And it says, point blank in the Bible there, Joshua is full of the Spirit of wisdom. Why? For. That word for means because. Because Moses laid his hands upon him. That's how he received that Spirit of wisdom. You're in Ephesians chapter 5. There's another way to get filled with the Spirit in God's, in God's methodology through songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And, you know, this isn't exhaustive, and there are some nuances and some, some variations kind of in, in how you're filled with the Spirit and the power that's given upon you. There's a, there's, a, there's a little bit of a difference between the laying on of hands, and you can see that in Scripture versus what music provides in, in, in being filled with the Spirit. But um, let's just look at, you know, it's, it's kind of a broad topic, so I'm, I'm kind of touching on things without going extremely into detail on each individual point. But just, I just want you to keep that in mind because they're not, it's not like one is a substitute for the other. But there's, there's kind of, I, I just want to point out there's a little bit of a difference here with that. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 17. Ephesians 5, this is the last place we'll turn. Ephesians 5, 17. The Bible reads, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. And again, he's speaking to believers. He's not saying that, you know, you need to get saved. He wants you to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, 
giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So he says here, be filled with the Spirit, speaking yourself in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, so it was, is what he follows that up with. One of the reasons why we, we sing congregational songs in church one of the reasons it helps get our hearts prepared, get ready, kind of get in the spirit, get, get thinking of the things of God, have our spirits all kind of, you know, be joined in unity as we congregationally sing praises unto the Lord together. Now, it also contrasts drunkenness with being filled with the spirit. And the, my last point is I'm just going to point out some, some differences between what the world or what the devil has to provide for being filled with his spirit and what God does. And, and see, what, the, what Satan does is he always mimics what God does, but he perverts it. So he, he, he makes things look like real similar to what God does, but he twists it, he corrupts it, he perverts it. And there is a way to be filled with another spirit but not a spirit of God. And that's why it says in verse 18, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Have you ever noticed when you, when you go to a grocery store, you might see, you know, wine and spirits or beer and spirits. They call booze, they call alcoholic drinks spirits. It's not because it's just um, some old people, they didn't know what they were talking about. They don't know science. No, they actually knew very well. Getting drunk will give you another spirit. Getting into that mindset, it gives you another spirit. Just like when we sing good songs here, you're filled with a good spirit. You're filled with the spirit of God. But when you, when you get drunk with wine, you are filled with another spirit. It's a false spirit, and it actually mimics the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Holy Spirit give you? It's going to give you boldness. You're going to be able to preach. You're going to be able to speak things. We saw over and over again. They're filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake. Filled with the Holy Ghost, they preach. Filled with the Holy Ghost, they had boldness. Well, what happens when someone gets drunk? They get bold, right? I mean, you can find the most quiet person and you get drunk and they're, oh, yeah, and they don't mind being the center of attention. They're willing to speak. A lot of times people will go out and get fights, right? Because they feel all tough and they feel manly and they feel strong because they've got another spirit that they've ingested. That's not their normal spirit. They've done that as a result of drinking. Now they're real tough. Now they're real mighty. Now maybe before they were afraid to talk, now they're willing to go up and talk to any woman and say whatever perverted thing comes out of their mouth because they're drunk. It gives you that spirit. But, I mean, do you notice, though, how it, it, that also gives you boldness, but not in a good way? That, that's a mimicry of what God has to offer. You think of even the worldly music can give you boldness. It gives you another spirit. Look, I'm someone, I've, I have loved music all of my life. I still love music to this day, but I was so much into the rock and roll, and, and, and you know, not just rock and roll, but like every genre. I loved all of the world's music. Everything the world had to put out, I loved that music. But you know what? One of the reasons I loved it is because of the feeling it gave me, and I could literally feel it in my spirit. And it would give me a spirit. And there are certain songs that would come on that would get me pumped up and get me full of energy. There's other songs that can make you kind of sad. There's other songs, you know. It gives you this spirit and it puts you in another spirit. Now, that's why we see here that when we know that music is powerful, we know that it's saying here, well, hey, speak yourself with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Those aren't the songs that I was listening to. The psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs will put you in a good spirit. It'll put you in a, in a you know, you, you can get in the spirit of God through this good music, through the right music. But through the wrong music, it puts you in the wrong spirit. Drinking alcohol, wrong spirit. We need to be filled with the spirit of God. <clears throat> Pray that you, you get more of God's spirit upon you. We, we need the boldness. Here's why we need the boldness. Why? Because... Nobody's going out and preaching the gospel. We see the Jehovah's Witnesses doing it, and we see the Mormons doing it, but it's a false gospel. It's another gospel. It's a works-based salvation. It's not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We need people to be filled with the Spirit of God to go out and to preach the gospel of Christ, salvation by grace through faith, eternal life through Jesus Christ. That needs to be done. The way that they did it in the book of Acts, the way they've done it throughout history, in God's church, among his people, having the boldness from the Holy Ghost 
to go out and speak the word of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that, that we have through your word, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to, to walk away this morning and not forget about the words that we heard preached, not forget about this, this doctrinal truth of being filled with the Spirit, dear God, and that we wouldn't be confused between the indwelling of the Holy Ghost versus the, the, uh, your power upon us with your Spirit, dear Lord. We know that we can never lose our salvation because you've, you've sealed us with that spirit of promise. But we pray that you would please um, rest your Holy Ghost upon us, dear Lord, upon our church. Help us all to be bold in, in our speech and in our actions, dear Lord, and, and standing strong for your word and doing what's right, dear God. Please help us to do many great works that would be honoring and glorifying, not unto us, but unto you, dear Lord, and unto your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.